In the late 1880s, many farm families in the Cullowhee Valley had achieved a lifestyle of some comfort and satisfaction, but they wanted a better life for their children. Education was the key, but in the aftermath of the Civil War, North Carolina, like most of the rural South, could offer only the most meager education. A young school teacher from Virginia, Robert Lee Madison, arrived in the North Carolina mountains in 1887. I was teaching my first school in North Carolina in Quala Township, Jackson County, near Whittier, when I had observed that the schools were too short and that the average teacher was too inefficient to make the public schools of any value. The best teachers in the county were those who had had instruction other than the public school curriculum in private institutions. I saw that the need of this immediate section was for better teachers and longer terms of school. For the terms were then only two or three months a year. The federal census of 1890 revealed that the state had the nation's highest white illiteracy rate. In 1877, Governor Zebulon Vance a native of Buncombe County, had begun to move toward recovery by establishing summer teacher training institutes. Mountain communities, however, did not wait passively for change to come from outside. In Cullowhee in 1888 and 1889, a group of community leaders who came to be called the Noble Nine took action. I was teaching at Silva. Over two years uh, later, Mr. L.J. Smith of Cullowhee, who had had three of his daughters going to school to me at Silver, came down and invited me to go up to Cullowhee with a view to meeting citizens there, taking charge of the whole school. From the start, the Cullowhee idea meant more to Madison than a subscription school. It was to be a grammar school, classical high school and a normal school, an institution to train teachers for rural and village schools. In 1891, after two years' existence of Cullowhee High School, secured a charter from the legislature in the winter of 1893. I wrote to our representative Honorable Walter E. Moore, and asked him to introduce a bill providing for the establishment of a normal department in connection with Cullowhee High School. Our normal department started in 93-94 with an appropriation of $1,500 annually. The first capital improvement money from the state was appropriated in 1903 for Madison Building. Two years later, the institution was taken over formally by the state to become Cullowhee Normal and Industrial School. Still, the school endured painful poverty throughout its early decades. Facilities remained primitive, and there were no dormitories until 1909, when Davis' home was built. President A.C. Reynolds described the campus on his arrival in 1912. We found an administration building of wooden construction with an auditorium on the second floor under which was grouped uh, several small classrooms, a girls' dormitory with accommodations for about 50 girls, and a central heating plant, all situated on the band hills overlooking the Tuckasee Deer River. The people of the community generously opened their homes for the accommodation of the boys. Nevertheless, students from the mountains enrolled in growing numbers. The construction of Joyner Building in 1913 alleviated crowding and gave the campus its center for the next 40 years. Madge Merrill came in 1923. That's where we did everything. I registered right there as you go up the steps. Mr. Bird was the uh, dean. He had his office there, and then upstairs we had the library. And then we had classrooms. That's where we had our classes. 
on each side of the stairway, we had our classrooms, you know. We did everything there, just about it. We had, uh, let's see, our science room was in the back of that building, clear to the back of it. And then our history was downstairs, I guess. In 1929, the school became a four-year college, dropping its high school grades and adopting the name Western Carolina Teachers College. The institution had outgrown its community origins to become truly regional in its role. Teacher training, this one thing we do well, in the words of President H.T. Hunter, continued to shape the school's identity. Student life in the school's rural setting focused on the campus. All students were members of either the Columbian or the Aerosophian Literary Society, which organized regular programs. Ray Gibbs was a Columbian. That uh, Bannister and Bill Madison met me in Webster when I came, I mean in Silver, when I came up on the train and challenged me to join the Columbian Literary Society while, before I ever got here. Students were required to attend Sunday school, church school, and weekday chapel. Rules were strict, particularly for women. And they wouldn't let us, we weren't supposed to sit with the boys in church, you know. <laughs> uh, no, we, maybe on a rare occasion, you know, but the girls danced together. And then uh, at Valentine, of course, we'd have a beautiful party for the boys because we decorated, you know hearts and everything, and then the boys. I believe we could dance with the boys maybe at Valentine. Possibly we could, I'm not sure. So then on Sunday afternoon from two to four, we had dates. Male students enjoyed more freedom. Ray Gibbs. Because we were just one big bunch. Mm -hmm. we, we played ball together, we fought together, we ate together, we slept in the same building, we stuck together. Student activities centered around the region's natural resources, hiking, camping parties to the Tuckasegee Falls and Whiteside Mountain, and visits to the Cherokee Indian Fair. Recreational sports were popular, but the college did not emphasize athletic competition until the 1920s in fear of distracting students from their studies. In the 1920s and 1930s, competition with other high schools and colleges in basketball, baseball, and football grew slowly, but enjoyed enthusiastic response. The Great Depression and World War II inflicted severe back-to-back -back blows on the school. By 1932, the state legislature had cut the school's budget by one-third, and faculty salaries fell by as much as 40 percent. However, Western managed more than mere survival in the Depression decade. Low tuition and modest financial assistance helped students stay in school, and enrollment grew substantially during the Depression years. Gerald Eller, who came to Culloway in 1939, when I was a student, 1939, 1943, uh, they very definitely made every effort to keep students in school once they were here. In my junior year, when I had uh, been unable to pay all my expenses for the preceding quarter, and had gone home to uh, try to raise money, and had been un unable to do so, I returned to the campus and uh, very much uh, disheartened and uh, discouraged because I felt certain I was going to have to leave school. I went over to see Mrs. Hines, um, Mrs. Ruth Oliver Hines, who was the bursar at that time, to apologize for not having been able to raise the money for the preceding quarter and tell her that I was going to have to leave school. And she uh, smiled and said, don't ever do that. Uh, said, I will give you a meal ticket and you can remain in school, and uh, together uh, we'll work something out. In 1939, the college celebrated its 50th birthday with the largest building program to date. Six new buildings funded by New Deal programs were dedicated. Western had never felt more sure of its future, but a new challenge replaced the old. World War II brought stress and change. 
Enrollment dropped by 50% as men and some women entered the armed services. 26 students and alumni and one staff member at the small school were killed in the war. The end of the war brought clamorous change to the quiet, contracted campus. Married veterans living in a cluster of prefabricated housing known as Budaville demanded a looser discipline. Tom Underwood, class of 1950. And of course, the time I got back up there that time, there's all the old veterans and stuff that come in there after the war, you know. Bunch of characters. Some of those boys have seen some pretty rough service. The concentration on teacher education broadened to include a non-teaching degree in liberal arts and science. Enrollment expanded from 500 to over 4,000 in the 1960s. New construction shifted the focus of the campus downhill toward Cullowee Creek. Student life reflected the spirit of change at Western Carolina. Though rules remained strict throughout the 1940s and 1950s, more and more students had cars, a little extra money, and a taste for independence. New student organizations and the first fraternities and sororities offered more choices. The college shop in Joyner and later in the student union were popular social centers, and most students went home on weekends. Gary Carden was a student in the 1950s. Cullowee was unbelievable at that time. It was really what uh, we called a suitcase college. You know, Friday afternoon would come and if you were up in the dorm, all you could hear was the wind blowing and doors slamming. And nobody was there. In 1967, the college became Western Carolina University with a new mission as a regional university. The stress of rapid growth, which was common to institutions of higher education across the country, affected Western profoundly by the early 1970s. Suzanne McDowell, class of 1972. We wore mainly dresses to class or carefully coordinated polyester pantsuits with the more bouffant hairstyles. People wore beer cans and stuff in their hair to roll it. <laughs> so as the jeans came along, the hairstyles came down also and, and it was more natural looking. I think people began to show more their individuality a little bit and they began to ignore rules that had been set up. Student unrest and tension between faculty and administration over university governance led to unprecedented turmoil. But in the aftermath, new leadership and a period of healing and reconciliation gave the university renewed faith in itself and its region. Western Carolina became both regional, serving North Carolina through teaching, service, and research, and comprehensive, offering a diverse array of programs. Minority and international students formed an increasingly important part of the university's enrollment and added a vital energy and diversity to an institution seeking to prepare its students for the modern world. International programs offered opportunities in a wide array of disciplines. In 1989, Western Carolina celebrated its centennial and its unique strengths, its priceless environment, its experienced faculty, and his historic commitment to service. In the 1990s, new leadership brought opportunities that triggered more than a decade of rapid growth. The student body expanded from 6,800 students to over 9,000, including distance learning enrollment. With this growth came funding for new facilities that changed the face of the campus, residence halls, a dining hall, and a fine and performing arts center. An initiative to raise the bar succeeded in improving university standards. SAT scores rose significantly, the Honors College expanded dramatically, and a successful undergraduate research program led to an intensified emphasis on applied learning for all students. Student athletic and recreational opportunities also were updated with the construction of new facilities. In 1996, the men's basketball team came agonizingly close to making NCAA tournament history to be the first number 16 seed 
to defeat a number one seat. The momentum for change begun in the 1990s continued into the 21st century with the creation of the University Millennium Campus for Health, Human Sciences, and Education. A partnership between a public university and private businesses will pioneer a new form of regional service to promote synergistic research and development in healthcare and gerontology. In 2011, Western Carolina welcomed David and Susan Belcher. Chancellor Belcher's remarkable energy, charisma, and his intuitive grasp of the university's heritage and potential initiated an unprecedented renewal of community spirit and confidence. WCU continued to grow with all-time highs in student enrollment and graduation and retention rates. The university consolidated graduate and undergraduate programs offered at locations scattered across Buncombe County on a new instructional site at Asheville's Biltmore Park. Western moved to the forefront of national efforts to address core higher education issues of access and affordability and embarked upon a fundraising campaign that would surpass $60 million for student scholarships and other support. Chancellor Belcher's tragic and unexpected death in 2018 left the WCU community in a state of shock and grief. But with a new vision of what Western is and what Western can be, the university's ongoing relationship with the people it serves continues to honor the bond of partnership that reaches back through the school's history from the founding of a small community school in the Cullowee Valley. That partnership continues to inspire its teaching, research, and service in its third century. As Western Carolina welcomes its 12th chancellor and first permanent female leader, Chancellor Kelly Brown affirms her commitment to Professor Madison's founding notion of the Cullowee idea of excellence in regional service. As Chancellor Brown says, the Western Carolina University that I have inherited represents a 21st century iteration of the Cullowee idea. Indeed, the progress of an idea continues. I pledge that during my time as Chancellor, Western Carolina University will remain connected to the people of the region and dedicated to honoring our collective past as we work toward a transformational future. Together, as we honor the promises of this great university, we will decide to succeed beyond our wildest dreams. I would say to my worthy former associates and my successors that I hope that they will carry on in the traditions of the past and in the best spirit of the past to greater and greater achievements in the interest of making Western Carolina Teachers College a center of culture, enlightenment, civic righteousness, and personal spirituality.